Well, bonjour et merci. Thank you for joining me today. This is the second week and coming to conclusion on Friday of the most recent climate change negotiations in Bonn, Germany. C'est aujourd'hui le presque la fin de les négociations actuellement sur changement climatique qui sont à ce moment uh, à Bonn pour uh, dans le, le train de négociation pour uh, le, le, les négociations pour après 2012, quand la première phase de Kyoto va terminer. They are negotiating as we speak to figure out what we do when 2012 arrives, and that's the end of the first negotiating period under Kyoto. There have been many things said in the House of Commons recently that suggest a lot of confusion about what was agreed to in Copenhagen, what was agreed to at the following negotiations in Mexico, and what lies ahead in South Africa for what will be called COP17. COP, of course, refers to Conference of the Parties. Uh, contrary to what the Minister of Environment said in the House last week, it's not the case that the Cancun agreements are based solely on what's called the Copenhagen Accord. So forgive me for giving a primer on negotiations at this point, but the Copenhagen Accord was not the result of the negotiations under the United Nations system in Copenhagen in uh, 2009. I know that's confusing. The negotiations and the Copenhagen Accord took place not with the sanction of the United Nations, but in a hotel room in a separate space in which a number of countries led by the United States and President Obama met to negotiate something they described as quote unquote politically binding. It did not receive the approval of the plenary of the United Nations delegates there gathered at COP15 in Copenhagen. In fact, it only received in the final statement of the real negotiations uh, the, uh, the little uh, oblique reference that the 15th Conference of the Parties, quote unquote, takes note of the so-called Copenhagen Accord. In Cancun the following year, the countries there gathered accepted that we would continue along two tracks those that would deal with countries that were outside the, the Kyoto Protocol looking for the second phase under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and those that insisted we must have a second phase of Kyoto. The second phase of Kyoto is thus still on the table. Most nations in the negotiations insist on a second phase of Kyoto. Back in December of 2010 in Mexico, it was only rumored that Canada would not participate in a second phase of Kyoto. It is now in these negotiations, in these last two weeks, and now I'll stop the history briefing and start with what's happening these last two weeks. For the first time, Canada's negotiators have said clearly that Canada does not intend to participate or agree to a second negotiating phase under Kyoto. C'est la première fois dans cette négoci ces négociations, dans les dernières dix jours, que le gouvernement de Canada, dans le contexte de négociations globales, a, conf a confirmé que le gouvernement de Canada n'est pas d'accord avec une deuxième phase dans le protocole de Kyoto. Mais en même temps, la grande majorité des nations dans les négociations exige que nous avons besoin d'une deuxième phase de Kyoto. There's another thing that happened in the last number of days that hasn't been reported in Canada, and that's that a number of countries have begun to discuss what measures should be taken to punish those countries that have not pursued Kyoto, have not lived up to their, nego their negotiated commitments. Uh, this is noted in a report that uh, the governments of a number of developing countries have suggested that a, a working group should be created to discuss legal action in relation to parties that do not want to fulfill their obligations under the protocol that refers to Kyoto or under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Certainly the European Union has already been known to discuss the possibility of trade tariffs and sanctions against Canada for failure to live up to our Kyoto commitments. So here we are at the end, coming up to the very end of key negotiations in the lead up to COP17 in South Africa. Once again, Canada has distinguished itself as being at the back of the pack. Just to give you a sense of how other countries are doing, reports from Bonn include that Norway has committed to being carbon neutral by 2030, explaining this will entail reducing emissions 100% 
below 1990 levels. Canada, meanwhile, with our current target, for which there is no plan to reach the current weak target of 17 percent below 2006 levels by, 19, uh, by 2020, actually amounts to leaving us several degrees above, several percentage points above 1990 levels by 2020. Contrast with Norway, 100 percent below 1990 levels. We will still be above 1990 levels. I could go on. The European Union is well below 1990 levels, closing in on a collective target of the European Union to be 30 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. Again, reiterating, Canada's current target will leave us above 1990 levels by 2020, and that's if we hit our target. Dans ce contexte, le gouvernement de Canada a abandonné la responsabilité pour euh, la croissance des gaz à effet de serre. Nous avons un, un cible fixé qui est trop faible, le plus faible dans tous les pays industrialisés. Et nous restons le seul pays dans le monde qui, euh, en ce moment, a refusé de, de faire un euh, essai. De, euh, pour atteindre les cibles fixées sur le protocole de Kyoto. Et le protocole de Kyoto, ce n'est pas qu -ce, euh, euh, un, un accord seulement des de, de bénévoles. C'est un protocole à, qui c'est dans la loi internationale, c'est la loi. Et le, le, le position, la position du gouvernement du Canada à ce moment, c'est contre une loi global. So our government has brought us to a place where we are among the, the most um, reckless of countries in response to the climate crisis. We have not met our targets, but worse than that, we're the only country that ratified Kyoto that has refused to try to reach our targets. Uh, these negotiations in Bonn are important. It's unfortunate that no Canadian journalists were present there. But Canadians who are interested in reading a blow-by-blow -blow account of what has happened in those negotiations are referred to an, a very excellent day-by-day -day account, which is uh, absent editorializing. Other governments around the world actually use it to report to capitals. It's called Earth Negotiations Bulletin, and it can be found at the International Institute for Sustainable Development website. I think it's important for Canadians to be able to track what our government is doing internationally in these negotiations. The challenge now is to find a way for Canada to accept that we will participate in the negotiations for a second phase of Kyoto. We can determine our targets. We can negotiate all kinds of flexibility. But it is a critical element of success for the world that we accept our obligations to be part of negotiating a second phase of Kyoto. There is simply no time left to negotiate in a completely separate agreement. The architecture of Kyoto is there. More countries want to join on this time, and it's critical that Canada stop being an obstacle and move to being a progressive nation. It is one of the most important things that could change the dynamic before South Africa will be if Canada changes its position and we agree to a second phase of Kyoto. Whether we're in the lead accepting tough targets, I don't expect that. But at the very minimum, we should not be an obstacle to the second phase that is so urgently needed. Merci beaucoup, and je suis prêt pour les questions. I have a question about Megan Leslie's bill. The NDP is reintroducing the climate change accountability bill that was killed in the Senate last year. Mm -hmm. um, what are your What are your thoughts on that and its chances in the House? Well, we fully support the Climate Change Accountability Act. It was initially when it was the Green Party supported it when it was first brought in by Jack Layton as a private member's bill. We uh, actually in the um, in negotiations that took place in Poznan in Poland uh, in 2008. I met at the time with the NDP environment critic and the Bloc environment critic and the liberal environment critic, and we all agreed there that it was urgent that bill be brought back. It was brought back in the next parliament by Bruce Heyer. We supported it then, and we continue to support Megan Leslie's attempts. But to be very realistic, when the government was a minority government and the votes were there in the House of Commons to pass that bill, we saw the most anti-democratic move by the Senate in at least 75 years with the decision to uh, pull a fast one procedurally. And at a moment when the mover of the bill, uh, Senator Grant Mitchell, was merely attempting to get his bill to committee, the Senate pulled a, a vote on the question and killed the bill before it could get to committee. And this was, of course, because Mr. Harper had the majority of the votes in the Senate. 
And the scuttlebutt is that he had informed his senators to find any opportunity to kill that bill fast. So I think the chances of the Climate Change Accountability Act being passed by this House of Commons are nil. And the chances of it surviving the Senate, if by some miracle it passed the House, are also nil. But it's important that we bring the bill forward again. It's important for Canadians that they see what real targets look like. Thanks. Il y a des autres questions? I also wanted to mention quickly, there's been a lot of dispute about what our tar sands emissions actually are, oil sands emissions. Just want to draw attention to anyone who's looking for more detail that we have just recently on the Green Party website posted a very exhaustive analysis of uh, the impacts of oil sands growth on various aspects of Canadian life. Uh, it was prepared by an independent researcher named Michelle Mech. It's a quite extraordinary and detailed review, and it can now be found on the Green Party website. And it points out that our emissions, as reported to the National Re uh, Inventory, are uh, in fact uh, less than the full emissions if you take into account all the upstream and downstream greenhouse gas emissions from oil sands. Thanks very much. Merci beaucoup.